invited to speak about uh, Justice Louis Brandeis. Um, I can't really remember when I first heard about Justice Brandeis, but I think you know anyone who grows up with an interest in American history, uh, I think encounters uh, Justice Brandeis uh, early on. And um, so, and, and certainly when I was in law school, I, I, I developed at least a kind of general appreciation uh, of the significance uh, of Brandeis, both as a lawyer and as a Supreme Court justice. But as uh, Andrea has already indicated, my real introduction to Louis Brandeis studies happened um, in the early 1980s. So when I was in, in graduate school in Boston, uh, I had a part-time position as a, uh, which was titled Lecturer in Legal Studies at Brandeis University, which had an undergrad, didn't, Brandeis did not have a law school, but it had an undergraduate legal studies major, and I taught a kind of basic introduction to the legal system course in that program. And then one day, Bill Goldsmith, a very sort of distinguished political science and American studies professor at Brandeis, who was sort of the keeper of the Louis Brandeis flame at, a flame at Brandeis University, uh, asked me if I would be willing to co-teach a seminar uh, with him on, on Louis Brandeis, particularly focusing on the career of Louis Brandeis, you know, the legal career of Louis Brandeis, as well as his judicial career. Uh, I think Bill was concerned that not having formal training in law, there might be something about the practice of law or legal vocabulary that he might not pick up on the significance, and so he wanted to have a kind of co-teacher who, who had at least some formal legal background. And um, I was delighted to do this, although I had no particular expertise in Louis Brandeis at the time. So I think that probably of all the students in that seminar, I probably learned the most. Uh, and I have continued to be interested in uh, Justice Brandeis and, and his time uh, ever since. Um, I, I, I should apologize. One thing that Andrea left out is that while I might or might not be a popular professor, I think I am widely known as the technologically least competent professor <laughs> at the Marquette University Law School. So I have to quickly figure out even how to move to the next slide. Down arrow. Down arrow. Down? Down. 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 Down is not really sufficient to encompass the entire uh, complexities of the career uh, of Louis Brandeis. So obviously I, I will be focusing uh, uh, more narrowly. I, I wanted to start though, uh, well I'm sure everyone here has heard of Louis Brandeis. I do have a sense that he has sort of receded into that category of significant American uh, historical figures where people still recognize the name as someone who's significant but have become less uh, certain about exactly what he's significant for, or even more likely to not exactly know when he was sort of on the stage and when he wasn't. So just a very quick biographical thumbnail sketch um, of, of Justice Brandeis. Uh, he was born in 1856 in Louisville, uh, Kentucky. His parents were German-Jewish uh, immigrants who had come to the Ohio Valley. I think they actually had lived in Indiana had relocated uh, to Louisville. Uh, obviously, this is on the eve of the Civil War. Um, uh, while Kentucky was a divided state, uh, the um, Brandeis family were solidly in the camp of the Union, and as were most uh, residents of the city of Louisville. Uh, but, of course, uh, Brandeis actually, of course, spent his first four years in a jurisdiction where slavery was still I guess the first nine years of his life in the jurisdiction where slavery was legal. Uh, he lived in Louisville until 1871 when his family decided to go back to Germany on an extended visit. Um, and this extended visit actually turned out to last for three years, at least for, for, for Lewis. Some of the other family members went back to Kentucky earlier. But during that time, he enrolled in a German high school uh, where he received um, a rather rig probably a much more rigorous academic training than he would have received at any school in Louisville or probably at most places in the United States. When he came back, uh, he decided to uh, enroll at Harvard University, uh, but to forego studying in the college uh, and just to enroll in the law school. Now, there was nothing absolutely um, remarkable about that. 
the, the Harvard Law School at that time did not require its students to have attended college, although many had. Uh, it, was, it was somewhat more remarkable that uh, Brandeis was still only, at this point, only 18 years old. That was a little unusual. Uh, he completed the Harvard Law School curriculum uh, in two years, uh, com graduating with the highest cumulative grade point average of anyone in the law school's history. Um, there was some question, though, about whether or not he would be permitted to graduate, because uh, technically you had to be uh, there was a rule at the law school that you had to be 21 years, one of the requirements for a degree was to be 21 years old, uh, which of course he would not be able to satisfy no matter how well he did in his classes. Uh, they finally adopted a special exception to the rule uh, so that Brandeis could graduate with his class. He was still too young to practice law uh, in almost every state at that point. You had to be 21 years of age before you could license to practice law. So he actually spent a third year at Harvard Law School after graduating, just waiting to turn 21 <laughs> so that he could begin his legal career. Um, the Brandeis family um, had um, uh, numerous connections throughout the sort of Ohio Valley um, region with other Jewish German families who had emigrated to the United States. And Brandeis had relatives who lived in St. Louis, and his sister had married uh, a lawyer from St. Louis. So he decided initially to begin his legal career in St. Louis, where he, he went in 1877, and then was the next year admitted to the bar, and, and set up practice in St. Louis. I think after three years in Germany and three years in Boston, there was just something lacking about St. Louis in the late 1870s. So, um, even though he seemed to be doing quite well as a lawyer, he was just not satisfied, with, particularly with the intellectual climate in St. Louis. So he had an opportunity to return to Boston to practice with one of his law school classmates, a man named Samuel Warren. And so he decided to do this. He was actually a practicing lawyer in St. Louis only for about seven months. Uh, he then, of course, returned to Boston where he practiced law until his appointment to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, in 1916, so it was almost 40 years as a practicing lawyer in Boston. Uh, he was, without doubt, uh, one of the more capable and also extraordinarily successful in a financial sense uh, lawyers in Boston in that era. Around the turn of the century, where the sort of benchmark for a really successful lawyer was having an income of $5,000 a year, and where probably over 60% of lawyers in Boston earn less than $3,000 a year. Um, Louis Brandeis, on average, took in an, excess, uh, an income of excess of $50,000 a year. So, I mean, he was, he was you know, arguably perhaps the most successful lawyer in the United States just in terms of fees generated by law practice. And, and he had a wide variety uh, of, of clients, um, obviously, he had a, a deep ties uh, to the Boston Jewish community, but it certainly was, his practice was in no way limited uh, to the Jewish community. In fact, in this part of his life, um, Justice Brandeis was not very religious. His parents had been sort of hostile to organized religion, although Brandeis confessed that he believed in a kind of providential God who at some level overlooked things. But otherwise. Brandeis was never a member of a synagogue. Um, the Brandeis family celebrated Christmas every year with the Christmas tree and gifts. There are some letters to Brandeis' and daughters where he goes on about what, a, when they were very young, about what a wonderful guy Santa Claus was. So, um, that, um, Brandeis never denied uh, being Jewish. He made no effort to disassociate himself from that. But his life as a lawyer in Boston was, was not that was deeply enmeshed uh, in the Jewish life in, in Boston. Now that changed, his, his relationship to Judaism changed, and this of course is a long, complicated story in itself, around 1912 when he became uh, a kind of advocate of Zionism and actually quickly became a major figure in American Zionism. Now, although in Brandeis' mind, he thought the idea of a Jewish state was important but not for American Jews to leave the country to go there. I mean, Brandeis 
was clearly of an American first and a Jew second, at least in his own mind. But, but that it was necessary to have a Jewish state because there were countries in the world that were not like the United States, that where Jews were not persecuted. That, so that you needed a Jewish state so that Jews who lived in countries where they were persecuted could then have a place to live and live in safety. And so that, that was sort of like, was that kind of linkage that sort of won a Justice Brandeis or future Justice Brandeis over to the cause of Zionism. Well, of course, in 1916, uh, he's nominated uh, by President Woodrow Wilson uh, to serve on the United States Supreme Court. Actually, in 1912, Wilson had come close to nominating or to appointing uh, Brandeis as Attorney General of the United States, but had backed, backed away from that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. But he does go on to the court four years later, and he serves on the court until 1939 when he decides, uh, well, he's still uh, perfectly in command of his uh, intellectual facilities and not particularly uh, unhealthy, but he's just reached the point where it makes sense to step down. In an era where that was not always the case, I mean, it was much more likely in that era that someone would just simply die in office as a Supreme Court Justice than retire. And then Justice Brandeis lived for another two years before passing away uh, in the middle of 1941. So again, that's just a, a very kind of general overview. Now, uh, at the title of this talk, at least on the posters, uh, might lead one to believe that I was going to talk about uh, Brandeis's views on the United States Constitution and their influence. And of course, that is an, his, his views on the Constitution were quite influential and helped sort of reshape the direction of American Congress on today. But again, just as part of this kind of now kind of extended introduction, I do want to just quickly summarize what we sort of associate with Justice Brandeis as a kind of constitutional theorist and a constitutional uh, and a maker of constitutional law as a judge. Probably most importantly, he was associated with a movement that, some, that historians sometimes refer to as sociological jurisprudence. Uh, the idea that law should not be thought of as something that's fixed or a body of unchangeable and immutable principles, but that, that law is something that needs to reflect the changing character of society. Uh, and so that particularly when there are new social and economic realities, uh, the law needs to be flexible enough to be adapted uh, to those. Uh, he also was, of course, a great supporter of the, what is referred to as just progressivism, the idea that the state has a duty to try to pass health and safety regulations that help mute the more harmful effects of industrialization uh, in sort of corporate capitalism. And, and Brandeis was both an advocate of such laws uh, and a defender of such laws. In fact, probably his most famous contribution to the legal profession, uh, the strategy uh, uh, called the Brandeis Brief, uh, where the lawyer files a brief with the court that not only attempts to state what the law is, but that the brief is also filled with lots of documentation of the social reality at issue. And in the original Brandeis brief, which was filed with the United States Supreme Court in 1908 in a case called Mueller versus Oregon, the issue was whether or not the hours of women uh, working in factories uh, uh, could be limited by the state. Uh, in other words, the, 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 or the state of Oregon had adopted a law that said that women working in factories could work no more than 10 hours a day. This was controversial because in 1905, the Supreme Court had ruled that unless the work was ultra-hazardous, the state could not limit the number of hours that an individual could work, that there was a liberty of contract protected by the 14th Amendment. Uh, that, that deserved constitutional protection. Now, Brandeis was a critic of that decision, uh, believed as a lawyer that it had been wrongly decided, but that, of course, was part of the backdrop in Mueller versus Oregon. So to try to convince the same court that had issued this decision just three years earlier that a limitation on women's hours uh, could be constitutional, he flooded the court with all this data about the special physical Need much of it actually, honestly, looking back, you know, from the advantage of a hundred plus years, looks a tad sexist. 
uh, because it focuses on the special vulnerability of women, the importance of women as child bearers, and that the fact that women might have to stand on their feet for more than 10 hours a day might affect their ability to bear children at some later point. But the larger point wasn't the, the nature of women. The point was that there were lots of reasons to think that, not, that something other than these abstract principles, that a person ought to have the right to work as much as they wanted to, that there were other considerations that the court ought to take into account. And the court, with many of the judges who had ruled one way in Lochner, seemingly switching their position in Mueller versus Oregon, and upholding the constitutionality of the Oregon minimum hour, or maximum hours law uh, for, for women. So this, this, this was very much a part of Brandeis's views, both before he went on the court and afterwards, that the industrialization was creating a whole set of new concerns uh, that the meaning of social justice had changed and it was the proper role of the state to try to address those types of concerns. He was also a great supporter of the rights of organized labor and that did, was not a uh, conventional position. And on, once he was on the Supreme Court, he was often in dissent, and particularly in the 1920s in cases involving organized labor. Uh, he was a great fan in some ways of American federalism. In, at least in the sense that he thought the individual states ought to have a broad freedom to experiment with different forms of democratic government and governmental regulation. Uh, he, as a Massachusetts lawyer, had had his hand in numerous things. And he was really responsible for the creation of the savings bank life insurance option in Massachusetts, which really didn't exist anywhere else, but you could buy a if you had a bank account, you could buy life insurance from your bank. You didn't necessarily have to go to an insurance company to do so. So he was very much in favor of states experimenting. And of course, his daughter, of course, ends up as a major figure in Wisconsin. His daughter who becomes a kind of sociologist and very much an advocate of Wisconsin as a kind of laboratory of experimentation for the next generation of social welfare. And that's how Brandeis thought the whole system should be working, and there shouldn't be these broad constitutional principles that could be invoked to try to limit the ability of states to do that. Um, he becomes uh, one of the great defenders, along with his colleague Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, of the principles of free speech. Uh, modern free First Amendment doctrine, and in many ways, legitimately really traces itself back to a series of dissents followed by Brandeis and Holmes in the early, late 19-teens and early 1920s. Uh, and he was, throughout his career, an adamant opponent of monopoly and, and consolidation generally. I mean, Brandeis believed strongly in the advantages of, of, of competition uh, in the marketplace. That even apart from just economic advantages, there were democratic advantages, instead of having large firms that dominated a particular area that was better for the country as a whole to have multiple firms competing, even if by chance the larger firm was more efficient. So he was a kind of, at a very kind of profound level, um, an opponent of monopoly. And of course that made him uh, sympathetic to the to enforcement of the antitrust laws. Okay, so that's the introduction. I, I actually want to speak on two Relative, much more narrow aspects of Brandeis's career and his appointment uh, and what his appointment to the Supreme Court meant. I, I want to talk first uh, about the concept of a Jewish seat on the Supreme Court. I think for anyone who kind of learned about the Supreme Court really from the 1940s to the 1970s, so this was a commonly used term, the Jewish seat. Uh, on the Supreme Court. So where did that idea come from? And was this an idea, as most people I think assume, somehow traceable back uh, to Louis Brandeis, since he was the first Jewish justice uh, on the Supreme Court? Then the second issue I want to talk about uh, involved the controversial nature of Brandeis's appointment. Uh, to the United States Supreme Court in 1916, which triggered a, 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 for several months a, a kind of a long, natural, a, a large, broad national debate about whether or not Justice uh, Louis Brandeis was fit to serve uh, on the United States Supreme Court, and what the consequences of that, those <laughs> hearings turned out to be 
not just for Justice Brandeis, because obviously he was appointed and served for many years, but what uh, what the, lo the long-term legacy of those hearings uh, turned out to be. Um, so first, just, just a few remarks about this uh, Jewish seat on the Supreme Court uh, idea. Uh, obviously, there had been no uh, Jewish American uh, who had served on the Supreme Court uh, before 1916. Uh, and of course, Brandeis's uh, nomination um, in, in the beginning of the year, of course, raised the possibility. Of, now, uh, one thing I think is people have forgotten about, the, the idea of the kind of Jewish seat actually predates this uh, in the form that Theodore Roosevelt thought it was important to have a, a Jew in the cabinet, uh, that the, the, the Jewish constituency in the United States, while not large in numerical terms, was uh, sufficiently important, particularly at a time when most American Jews supported the Republican Party. And, and, and the, the Jewish presence in finance and sort of uh, large industry was becoming more apparent. And, and so Roosevelt appointed a man named Leon Strauss as Secretary of the Treasury during his... Uh, and, and so this idea about, you know, should there be a Jewish seat in the cabinet actually begins uh, about a decade earlier than the discussion about the Jewish seat uh, in the Supreme Court. Now, uh, I think, though, the idea that somehow this started with Louis Brandeis and ran, runs continuously, or somehow the Brandeis seat was the Jewish seat, it doesn't quite match up with the historical record. Uh, first of all, while Brandeis was on the court, although be it um, well into his career on the bench, of course, uh, Justice <coughs> Benjamin Cardozo was appointed by Herbert, New York Supreme Court Justice Benjamin Cardozo was appointed to the United States Supreme Court uh, by Herbert Hoover. Uh, of course, Cardozo was himself also Jewish. So, for at least for most of the 1930s, uh, there were two American Jews on the Supreme Court, uh, not just one. And I don't think no one is really talking about the, the Jewish seat in the 1930s because there were there two, and, 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 there's, and no one exactly knows what's followed. What followed. Um, actually, I think, if anything deserves the label the Jewish seat, it turns out it was not Brandeis' seat, uh, but it was Cardozo's seat. And I think for most of us who kind of came of age in the 1950s and 60s or 70s and with, with this idea that there was a Jewish seat, uh, that it was the, actually the seat that had been first uh, occupied by Cardozo, which remained in the, the sort of, was filled by uh, a, a Jewish representative uh, for over 30 years. Um, now, the Brandeis, again, I'm not sure how important this is, but it seems sort of interesting, that um, the Brandeis seat almost became a Jewish seat of sorts uh, in 1937, uh, when Franklin Roosevelt um, started to try to, in, in, um, Brandeis had been a longtime advisor to Franklin Roosevelt, <laughs> on a variety of legal and constitutional questions, but um, you may recall the whole episode about the court packing plan in, in 1937, where um, while Roosevelt considered Brandeis a solid, although not 100% solid, supporter of the New Deal, Brandeis had voted to overturn uh, several aspects of the National Recovery Act. Um, Roosevelt was not really worried about Brandeis on the court, but he was worried that the Supreme Court might undercut the New Deal by striking down the constitutionality of the Social Security Act and the National Labor Relations Act, or particularly this so-called legislation of the second New Deal. And so he comes up, he and his advisor, and he come up with this idea for what came to be known as the court packing plan. Of course, that's not how its advocates described it, but the notion was that if the Supreme Court justice turned 70 and a half, and decided not to retire, the President of the United States could add an additional justice to the court on the theory that this would help with the workload. That as judges got older, it would be harder for them to carry the same kind of caseload. So they weren't being forced to retire, but they would get additional assistance. Um, it turns out, of course, there were, I think it were four justices at that point who were already over 70 and a half. 
uh, some of whom supported Roosevelt, but most of whom didn't. And I think it was just too obvious what this was about. This was to put, of course, Roosevelt would pick the four new justices. Of course, they would all be vetted to make sure they were enthusiastic believers in the constitutionality of the New Deal, and this would create a pro-New Deal majority. Uh, Roosevelt was riding a hot streak. He had just been a re-elected president by the largest margin in American history. In the 1936 election, he carried 48, or 46 states out of 48. Uh, he only lost Maine and Vermont, carried everything else, including the home state, Kansas, of his Republican opponent, <laughs> Alf Landon. So, I think that, and the, the Democrats had something like uh, three-quarters majorities in both houses of Congress. So I think Roosevelt thought this plan for the court, the only part of the government not solidly controlled by New Dealers was the Supreme Court, and the court packing plan was to take care of that. It's one of the few mistakes that Franklin Roosevelt made in his illustrious presidency. Um, the, the court packing plan was not received uh, nearly uh, as enthusiastically by the population as he expected. It certainly was not received very happily by the older justices on the Supreme Court, including Louis Brandeis, uh, who was outraged you know, at this implication that somehow he was not pulling his load. Chief Justice Hughes, who was also usually in the pro-New Deal camp, felt the same way, read this extensive document showing the court was actually more caught up on its docket than it had been in about 20 years, so there was nothing to this falling behind in their work because they're so old idea at all. Uh, and actually at this point, um, um, Brandeis sort of has a falling out with both Roosevelt and Felix Frankfurt, who I've said has been sort of his protege for years. Um, and then Roosevelt has the bad judgment to ask Brandeis if he would consider retiring. <laughs> um, so that he could appoint Felix Frankfurter to the seat. I guess assuming that Brandeis would consider Frankfurter an appropriate and by at least ethnicity and religion Jewish uh, successor to himself, but Brandeis would have none of this. He was mad, and he was also mad at Frankfurter for supporting the court packing plan. So he was not going to retire. So that so that eliminated the possibility at least at that point that Brandeis's replacement would be a Jewish justice and continue the tradition um, when um, uh, and, and then when Cardozo died somewhat unexpectedly in 1938 uh, the next year uh, Franklin Roosevelt goes ahead and appoints Felix Frankfurt to the Cardozo seat so Frankfurt is on the court and over a very a year or so um, Brandeis and Frankfurt are our colleagues uh, on the court. Uh, what's interesting about this thing is what happens when Brandeis steps down? Well, there's no sense that, well, we need to have a Jew on the court because we already have a Jewish justice. So for anyone who cares about that, Frankfurter is already on the court. What was interesting was there a sense that the successor to Justice Brandeis ought to be a, a disciple of Justice Brandeis. And the person, of course, Roosevelt ultimately selects is William O. Douglas who had modeled his career on at least what he understood to be the principles uh, of Louis Brandeis. So in a way, the Brandeis seat on the court didn't become a Jewish seat on the court. It became a Brandeis seat on the court. Now, one can question whether or not John Paul Stevens really fit that model. Probably not when he was appointed, but he grew into a kind of Brandeis-like uh, justice. And I suppose you could argue that in some kind of broad way of intellectual inheritance that uh, Elena Kagan is a kind of Brandeisian uh, justice. Just quickly, the other seat, of course, after Frankfurter retired, uh, he was replaced by Arthur Goldberg. Uh, President Johnson sort of pressured Goldberg to step down so that he could appoint his good friend Abe Fortas to the court. But of course, Fortas, like Goldberg, were both Jewish, so that didn't affect that. And unfortunately, when Justice Fortas was forced to resign over some conflict of interest uh, issues, the, the kind of Jewish seat, at least temporarily, uh, came to an end uh, when uh, President Nixon was tried first with two non-Jewish Southerners, uh, Hainsworth and Carswell, who didn't get it confirmed, and then appointed Harry Blackman, who held that seat. Although when Blackman retired in 1994, uh, Stephen, uh, President Clinton appointed Stephen Breyer 
to the seed, and Briar, of course, is Jewish. So in a sense, there has been a Jewish seed, except for this Blackman interlude, but it's not really been Brandeis' seed. It was the Cardozo seed uh, that became the sort of Jewish seed. Um, okay, now I want to turn for the rest of the talk uh, to the confirmation here. Um, Brandeis was a uh, when Brandeis was adopted, announced for the Supreme Court by Wilson, it, it, it was, I think, very few people who had been in any way involved in public life responded to that with, who's he? I mean, uh, Brandeis was probably the best known lawyer in the United States in 1916. Um, he, he was admittedly a, a controversial figure, right? He had, you know, he had been he had, had a highly visible public career where he was uh, attempting to advance what he thought were worthy uh, political and legal causes. Um, and uh, there were many people who loved and admired Louis Brandeis, and there were many people who uh, detested uh, Louis Brandeis. Now, up until this point, there was a long history of of, of contests over Supreme Court nominations. It would be a mistake to think that before Justice Brandeis, there was a kind of unwritten rule that Congress should afford, should um, automatically approve the appointment of a Supreme Court justice by a Supreme Court justice. I mean, even George Washington's uh, second choice for a Chief Justice, John Rutledge, uh, was turned down by Congress. And uh, poor President Tyler, I think, made four nominations to the Supreme Court, none of which were approved by Congress. So there, there, were, there had been a history, and many of these contests had been clearly partisan, that, that when one party controlled Congress and a different, the other party controlled the presidency, uh, that was a challenge to get for the, the president to get his nominees approved. But before Brandeis, um, there had never been congressional hearings on a Supreme Court justice. And, of course, no Supreme Court justice had ever appeared before Congress, excuse me, no Supreme Court nominee had ever appeared before Congress. Now, as it turns out, Brandeis did not actually appear before Congress, but he wanted to. Uh, it was his, his supporters and advisors uh, talked him out on so. But the, at least I think one can say that the modern process, you know, of not just the Senate voting up or down on a nominee, but the Senate going through the process of evaluating the president's nominee through hearings, you know, and, and only then voting, uh, actually begins uh, with Justice Brandeis. So I guess the, the question here, of course, is why? Why was uh, Brandeis' nomination uh, apparently so controversial that it led to a, a sort of change uh, in the mechanism by which the Senate evaluated um, uh, candidates? Uh, in fact, um, after President Wilson nominated Brandeis, uh, the Senate voted to convene a special subcommittee uh, of the uh, Senate uh, Judiciary Committee to investigate the qualifications uh, of, of Louis Brandeis for the Supreme Court. So why was that thought to be necessary, right? Why did that happen? Well, as I said before, uh, Brandeis was a highly controversial figure uh, who was disliked by a large percentage of the American, uh, at least legal and corporate community. Now, why was that? Well, that's what I wanted to talk about in just a second, but just a, I just want to just share with you a couple of versions of this. This is William Howard Taft, of course, had actually been the president uh, from 1909 to 1913, but had been defeated for re-election by Woodrow Wilson. That was actually one of the, uh, one of the rare three-way elections of the Theodore Roosevelt, who had stepped down as president, but then decided he wanted to be president again, uh, failed in his efforts to get the Republican nomination and then ran as an independent progressive and actually did much better than Taft in the 1912 election, but with the Republican Party split in half, the Democrats regained the presidency for the first time in a generation uh, through Woodrow Wilson. Uh, so uh, Taft, of course, always wanted to be Chief Justice more than he wanted to be president, or at least wanted to be a member of the Supreme Court. 
and he had, I think, somewhat unrealistically, uh, some hopes that in 1916 that Wilson might appoint him to the Supreme Court. Uh, but this was actually in a private letter that Brandeis is a muckraker and emotionless for his own purposes, a socialist prompted by jealousy, a hypocrite, a man who has certain high ideals in his imagination but who is utterly unscrupulous in method in reaching them, a man of infinite cunning, of great tenacity of purpose, and in my judgment of much power for evil. Obviously, Taft did not <laughs> like Brandeis. Now, there was an even more obvious explanation, lost, almost lost to memory, but during something called the Ballinger Pinchot hearings, uh, Taft's Secretary of the Interior uh, had been accused by officials, with, by some of his underlings, uh, with trying to consciously prevent land from being taken out of the availability of the public sector and made in the national parks. This is the era where Yellowstone National Park is created. Uh, that had really begun under the Roosevelt administration, continued under Taft, but there were some accusations that Ballinger was in league with a variety of big <coughs> corporate exploiters who wanted to mine on uh, federally owned land and didn't Brandeis was brought into this as a lawyer, actually for initially for Collier's magazine, which had published these accusations and was worried about being sued for libel. Um, but in the course of these, and Pinchot was another environment, of, another government official, but who was associated with expanding the national park system and had accused Ballinger of, you know, of this deceitful conduct. And in the course of those hearings, Brandeis exposed the fact that President Taft, in an effort to try to put a lid on this, had actually misdated some documents or had, had kind of publicly lied about when certain uh, agreements and statements had been made. It's very quite embarrassing to Taft, and I don't think he ever quite got over uh, it. Um, but I think it, I'm not suggesting that Taft was just personally mad at Brandeis. I think we do here see that there is a sense that this man is a radical, this man is, has beliefs that are not really beneficial for the country. Um, the Wall Street Journal, taking a kind of similar line, the Taft's letter was a private letter not intended for public distribution. The Wall Street Journal, though, referred to Brandeis as the leader of anti-corporation agitation. Um, where others were radical, he was rabid. Uh, where others were extreme, he was super, I misspelled it, but it should be super extreme. Uh, where others would um, trim, uh, he would lay the ax to the root of the tree. You know, again, it's expressed that Brandeis isn't just a normal liberal, he's a real radical, or even possibly a socialist, as Taft believed. Now, this is, of course, this is, there's a kind of undercurrent to all this, which became explicit at least in the, in the words of one of Brandeis's opponents from Boston, a, a fellow lawyer named William Fitzgerald, the fact that a slimy fellow of this kind by his, should be smoothness and intrigue, together with his Jewish instinct to be appointed to the Supreme Court, should teach an object lesson to all true Americans. I mean, here a kind of an explicit statement of anti-Semitism. And of course, this has been a question which all of Brandeis's biographers have had to struggle with. You know, to what extent was this concerted effort to keep Brandeis from going on to the Supreme Court a, a product simply of anti-Semitism? You know, so was this, he's a radical, he's a socialist, was that really just a kind of smokescreen for what was really just a, a matter uh, of hypocrisy, I mean, a matter of, of racial prejudice and otherwise, uh, so these, the, the kind of political claim was really just sort of hypocritical. Um, as you probably many of you who have ever looked into this know that uh, Brandeis's biographers have differed on this point. You know, the most recent biography, uh, written by Mel Yurofsky, who just coincidentally is a friend of mine, also Jewish, actually takes the position that while anti-Semitism was sort of present in the background, it was not really the animating force. But, but this is one of the issues of which Brandeis biographers have reached quite different conclusions. If we look at the actual vote uh, in the Senate, um, so there was this, this period of, 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 of here, the Brandeis hearings went on for about a month every day, then the Senate sat on it for a couple of months, and then finally uh, voted 
uh, for his uh, confirmation. If we actually look at these, there were actually were three Senate votes. First, the subcommittee that had investigated him, uh, uh, which uh, consisted of three Democrats and two Republicans. And after these seemingly endless hearings and unprecedented hearings, they ended up voting three to two to pass his name on with the endorsement to the full committee. The three Democrats voted uh, to endorse Brandeis, the two Republicans opposed it. Uh, when it went to the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, the vote was 10 to 8. Ten Democrats on the committee voted to approve Brandeis's appointment. Uh, eight Republicans opposed it. When it went to the vote of the full Senate, you can see the Democrats vote overwhelmingly. There's a single vote against it. That's a senator from Nevada. Uh, votes against it, but the one center's missing, but the other 54 support it. Uh, the Republicans are not quite as uniform. Uh, five Republicans do vote for Brandeis. I'm happy to say one of them was uh, fighting Bob Follett, <laughs> who broke. And, and in fact, the, uh, the five Republicans were all members of this progressive faction that had supported Frank, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, but had come back to the fold. But, were not willing to join. Right. This was a kind of an important vote for Republicans, it turned out. Um, this was, of course, coming on in an election year. Of course, the, the, the 1916 presidential election was upcoming. The Republican Party had dominated Congress until 1912, but had lost control. And I think Republicans in Congress were under tremendous pressure because they'd almost committed suicide in 1912 by splitting into two parties. And there was tremendous pressure on the Senate Republican minority to, to keep in rank. And the Republican leadership decided they were going to fight this Brandeis nomination. And so, but at least five Republicans were, were broke ranks. <laughs> now, if you just look at this vote, it's hard to exactly to know where the anti-Semitism component is. There were some people... now. It, it would be a, a mistake to say that people were not aware that this was a potential issue. Brandeis himself scuttled a plan to put together a, a petition signed by all the Jewish, the leading Jewish lawyers of the country uh, that would endorse his candidacy. He thought that that would not actually help. And so, um, and, and um, Brandeis's law partner McLennan, who sort of managed the campaign, he was not Jewish himself, strongly supported. He was he thought a real danger were Southern Democrats, white Southern Democrats would be likely to vote against him on the religious issue. Although as it turned out, every white Southern Democrat actually voted for his uh, confirmation. Um, actually the New York Sun, which was a then important newspaper, actually ran a story suggesting that Brandeis's Judaism might actually be a plus. Uh, that there were members of the Senate who would have otherwise been imposed, uh, inclined to vote against him, but didn't want to do so because they would then be accused of being anti-Semitic. One of those kind of historical coincidences, the Leo Frank episode, you know, and an example you know, of kind of obvious and vicious anti-Semitism, had just occurred a few months before, and, you know, and it had, particularly for these Southern white Democrats, it had sort of tarred the whole South with this anti-Semitic brush. And so I think there was something to that, right? That, that probably some, Hope Smith, the Georgia senator, initially indicated that he was going to vote against Brandeis, but then actually met with Brandeis, and then changed his mind. But I think part, Hope Smith, of course, was from Georgia, where the Frank case had occurred, and I think Smith didn't want to be labeled as an anti-Semite. Uh, and so there might have been something to this New York sign. But again, if one just looks at the voting pattern, it's hard to see that this is anything other than a kind of strict. When push came to shove, uh, this was really a party issue, with a small number of liberal Republicans breaking ranks. But otherwise, it all came down to if you were a Democrat, you voted for Brandeis. If you were a Republican, uh, you voted against him. Um, now, I, but nevertheless, so you could say, okay, well, that's the Senate. But what about those here? Um, while Brandeis was adored by many people, uh, he was not everybody's fav favorite person. Of course, many of these Boston lawyers had hooked horns 
with Brandeis over the years in, in various forms of litigation. Um, Brandeis did have some peculiarities, and, and this, I think, actually makes him near it. Um, he was an avid horseman, as I mentioned, and canoeist, but he thought there was nothing was more bizarre than spectator sports. He just couldn't get it, right? Why would somebody just pay money to go somewhere and sit and watch other people do something athletic? Just didn't get it. The other thing he thought was a complete waste of time was small talk. <laughs> he loved to talk about labor statistics or political issues or constitutional questions, but he hated, and in fact, this somewhat to the dismay of his law partners, he insisted of keeping the temperatures in the law firm waiting room as low as possible. <laughs> because he felt like when people, when it was that cold, uh, the potential clients would just get right to the point. <laughs> and, uh, and as a lawyer, wouldn't have to sit there and indulge them as they just rattled on and on. Um, so, so there was a humorous side to this, but also Brandeis, once he took a case, um, and I'm going to talk just a minute about why he took certain cases and not others, was absolutely zealous. And he completely rejected the notion that lawyers had a kind of independent duty to, to be um, accommodating to each other. I think it's everywhere a kind of informal rule of the American bar that if a lawyer against whom you're litigating uh, asks for a continuance, you, the lawyer for the other side, um, agree to that. It's just as a matter of professional courtesy to the other lawyer. At least everywhere I've lived, that's been a kind of general rule. Brandeis refused to do that. Right? He just didn't think that that was the right thing to do. So, so he did have a reputation, at least among some lawyers, as being sort of uncollegial. And again, you know, he, even though he was phenomenally wealthy by lawyer standards, he lived quite modest. Um, you know, and he didn't like to entertain he liked to invite people over to talk about politics or social policy, but he didn't, you know, he, he was not part of the social world of the Boston Bar. Or anything. So I think he did not endear himself to people who had other reasons to dislike him. But again, this is hardly enough to go to such lengths to try to prevent him from going onto the Supreme Court. I do think there is something to this that Taft's point. The man is a socialist, right? You know, the man is out to destroy American business. Clearly he wasn't. He wasn't a socialist. I mean, he really thought that this kind of modest reform actually was the key to keeping capitalism from falling under a kind of attack from more radical, from real radical. So, but I think because Brandeis was so adamant in his career, particularly in, in, in involved in various controversies over utilities in Boston, which were a source of great controversy in the late 19th, early 20th century. And, and, uh, and the willingness of Brandeis to do whatever it took to advance his side of the argument, often embarrassing his opponents you know, by revealing unflattering things about their financial dealings or things like this. He also was obsessive about this anti-monopoly view. And he's probably best known, or he's probably best known for his efforts to try to prevent the, the New York and New Haven Railroad from taking over all the railroads and streetcar lines in New England. Uh, the, the New Haven Railroad was financed by J.P. Morgan. You know, it was just part of a large Morgan financial empire. Uh, they were, um, uh, the idea was that New England railroads could be much more efficient and return higher yields if they were all under a kind of centralized control I think economic historians, I think, actually think there probably was something to that. Uh, that competition in railroads at a regional level was not necessarily a good thing. But Brandeis went to great lengths to try to prevent the New Haven from taking over the Boston and Maine Railroad or various state, um, inter, in, state interurban lines and things like this. He was a frequently testifying before the Massachusetts legislature trying to get new statutes enacted to make it much more difficult for the New Haven line and its Morgan interest backers. It turns out, of course, that most of the wealthy people of Boston actually supported the New Haven Railroad. Right? It paid the highest interest rates on its bonds of any, and stock on any railroad in the United States. It was a great investment. The, the kind of State Street bankers were all heavily invested in the New Haven Railroad, and here's Brandeis trying to 
keep it out uh, of, of Massachusetts. And um, so there, I think, you know, there, there was something not exactly radical about um, Brandeis's political views, but uh, they were, there was something progressive about Brandeis's political views, and he was willing to fight for those views, even, you know, sometimes it seems like he was not particularly concerned about the feelings uh, of, of his opponents. But I'm convinced that the most, at the core of this opposition to Brandeis, was Brandeis' views about the ethical obligations of lawyers. And I'll try to make this quick. In the early 20th century, there was a major split among the elite American bar uh, over just the very nature of what lawyers were or were not. There had always been this, there had always been this kind of bifurcated aspect of lawyers. Now, on the one hand, they were just people who provided legal services to a fee to their clients. But on the other hand, you know, going back to Tocqueville, you know, who found that in the 1830s there is no natural aristocracy in the United States. The closest thing we have to a, a, a true elite in the United States are the lawyers. They're the best educated, they're the smartest people, they, they control, they, they are chosen to fill political offices. So the law is very much a public profession. But those, of course, are two inconsistent ideas in some way. That, that lawyers are essentially kind of public actors who are autonomous moral agents who are trying to advance the good of the whole society, and there are lawyers who represent clients you know, and provide them with legal services. In 1905, President Roosevelt gave a speech at the Harvard commencement where he took to task the corporation lawyers of the day. Uh, that, uh, that, according to Roosevelt, the best lawyers in the United States had sold out to these large corporations. They were no longer trying to advance the, the, the public interest. They were just for their own enrichment, doing whatever it took. There's this wonderful line attributed to J.P. Morgan, which he may or may not have actually said, but if he didn't say it, he believed it, that I don't need lawyers to tell me what I can do and what I can't do. I need lawyers to tell me how to do what I want to do. <laughs> well, that was the exact opposite of what Louis Brandeis believed. Uh, Brandeis believed that lawyers had an independent op obligation to advance the interests uh, of justice. Um, and that um, if you could not just, that lawyers could not absolve themselves of blame if they were affiliated with bad causes. So Brandeis really was, in most cases, sort of like Perry Mason. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the episode of, there's one episode of Perry Mason where there's this hysterical young woman who's come into his office. She's accused of murdering uh, her husband. And she's saying, you know, I didn't murder him, but nobody believes me. The police think I murdered my husband. My husband's family think I murdered my husband. Our friends all think I murdered my husband. You, pointing to Perry Mason, you think I murdered my husband. Then he cuts her off. No, ma'am, I don't. If I thought you murdered your husband, I wouldn't be representing you. I'm o I only represent people who are innocent. Well, of course, that's not real lawyer. <laughs> that's what the public sort of wanted. And Brandeis believed that. Now, he didn't do criminal work. But, I mean, Brandeis really believed that a lawyer should not represent someone unless they think their cause was just. Uh, now, in many cases, it's not really a justice, injustice, in providing legal services for business. He was the lawyer for Feline, the, the founder of the Feline's department store. Um, you know, most of the work he did for the Felines, it wasn't a matter of just or unjust, they just needed legal services and he provided them. But he, he really believed that it was, in a, and that if a lawyer took a case but he found out where his client was, unjust, was not in the right, he should counsel settlement. And if the client refused to settle, the lawyer should withdraw. This is not textbook uh, legal ethics. So, and I do think now, the, that's not all, it, it's tended to think that this is a good thing that, that on, the, on Brandeis' part, you know, that he put justice ahead of the narrow interest of his clients. On the other hand, sometimes this led to questionable activities. He was, for many years, the lawyer for a company called the United Shoe Machinery Company, which in the late, in around 1900, established a monopoly in the United States through mergers. Uh, of all the firms that made the equipment you use to make shoes, 
that shoe companies use to make shoes. And the United Machinery Company did not sell their products. They only leased them. So if you were in the shoe manufacturing business and you wanted this equipment to make shoes, you could lease it from the United uh, Shoe Machinery Company, but you couldn't buy them, which of course gave, particularly since this is the only company selling this equipment, of course gave them enormous power uh, over their um, uh, uh, customers. Well, um, Brandeis, of course, is actually, when they form the company, Brandeis is their lawyer. So he basically does the legal work for creating the United uh, Shoe Machinery a Company, and, and initially, at least, he buys into this. He's, uh, he's not only their lawyer, he accepts a seat on the board of directors. He, he was generally reluctant to buy stock. He was a bonds man. And when he died, he was worth about $3 million, 90% of which were bonds. But this time, he buys stock, because he thinks this company's got real potential. But over the years, he starts to have second thoughts about it particularly when a competitor arises. And the United uh, Shoe Machinery Company is able to convince the competitor's banks to cut off loans, <laughs> and then forcing basically the competitor to sell out to the United, to reestablish the monopoly. And so Brandeis starts consulting with Bob LaFollette, actually, about this problem. And actually, through their efforts, the Justice Department launches an antitrust case against the United a shoe machine company in which Brandeis helps counsel the government uh, you know, about how to file this case. And of course, he's wonderfully prepared for that since it's all <laughs> stuff that he's done. <laughs> that is not, traditional ethics well. are not as important as the public interest. Right. That if this is a monopoly that's suppressing competition, that's hurting the public, uh, it deserves to be eliminated. Uh, and so, I mean, Again, you can admire this or say this is not quite right, but in Brandeis's mind, you know, it was the public interest as he understood it that came first. Just I'll wrap up with this. He also, right, this had this concept uh, of, of the, the lawyer for the situation. That now this is most obvious when you represent an entire family on sort of a state plan, you know, where you're the lawyer for the husband, for the wife, for the children, uh, for the grandparents. And, and Brandeis thought there was no problem with that, in that you didn't have a particular client in that case. You were, a, the situation was your client. You know, the whole family was your client. But he extended that beyond just this sort of state planning context. So, um, there, and, and this came up in these hearings. People would complain, well, I hired Louis Brandeis as my lawyer, but halfway through I decided he was working for the other side. because. You know, he was telling me to settle, or you know, he was telling me my case had no merit. Right? You know, that this was not what I expected uh, from my lawyer. And Brandeis was saying, "Well, no." Brandeis often defended himself. And, no, I'm not your lawyer. You hired me to give you advice. Right? You know, again, it's this idea of lawyer as autonomous moral agent. Right? Louis Brandeis saw himself as someone, you know, who who a talented, knowledgeable man who could be hired to give advice, and you might not like the advice, but that was what he was providing. You know, again, this is not a textbook lawyer. If you actually go back and read through the, the congressional record where these statements are made, this is, this is the real theme of the opposition of Brandeis. He's, he's a lawyer who doesn't play by the rules that lawyers are supposed to play by. Now, again, I think this is not that the Brandeis is a lone wolf. My own view is the bar is really split in half on it. That's why, of course, there are many lawyers who support uh, Brandeis, because they think that lawyers should be autonomous moral agents and not just high, highly paid um, uh, you know, uh, servants of the people who pay their fees. So I, and my own view is that the opposition to Brandeis was partially anti-Semitic, partially because people personally didn't like him, but at its root, in part partially political, but at its root, I think many lawyers were really troubled by this sort of public interest first. In, in some ways, Brandeis was sort of the first cause lawyer, right? you know, who, who devotes his career not to the representing clients, but to the advancement of a particular cause. Now, in his case, the particular cause was the benefit of society, read a broad particular cause. So in any event, I, I feel like I've probably run over here, but I, um, I think, you know, so quite apart from 
what this story about Brandeis's ethics tells us or doesn't tell us. This experience completely transformed the way in which the future senates would think about uh, future nominees to the Supreme Court. That rather than just voting up or down on the president's nominee uh, based on what you knew or didn't know about the candidate, that it was a proper role for the Senate to investigate the views, in which we've seen much more recently, of course, with the Bork hearings and the Clarence Thomas hearings, et cetera, et cetera. All right, well, I think um, I've talked about 15 minutes longer than I was supposed to. But I'll be, uh, if you have to leave, I certainly understand that, but if, you, if people have questions, I... I